This past week, April 9th, was Dyer Yassin Remembrance Day for Palestinians and for others around the world. It commemorates the 1948 killing of Palestinian civilians in a small village of less than 750 people. It occurred during the war in what is now Israel, and it was called the Israeli War of Independence from Israel's side. It has been referred to as a massacre, and it is referenced in current events in the desperate food shortage in Gaza that's going on currently. There are annual commemorations throughout the world. You may not know this, but the United States installed and dedicated a Dier Yassin Memorial in New York, in Geneva, New York, in 2003. It's a bronze sculpture depicting an uprooted olive tree, and it was created by the Arab American artist and pacifist, Khalil Bendib. However, at the actual ruin site of Dier Yassin, Palestinians continue to ask Israel for permission to build a memorial, and they are continually denied. Today, we are going to take a short journey into history, controversy, and the needs that currently surround the past tragedy and the current tragedy. Dier Yassin once was once a prosperous Palestinian village of about 750 people. It was situated up on the high ground between Israel and Tel Aviv. Oh, I misspoke. Between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. It lay outside of the area assigned by the United Nations to the Jewish state. The village was known for its limestone stores and its skilled lime cutters. There were terraces and stone homes where multi-generational families lived. Currently, what is left of the old village is located behind locked gates of a Jewish psychiatric hospital compound. Most of the old city lies in ruins, and a very short poem by Rhonda describes the haunting feeling of having a psychiatric hospital there. Insanity housed upon atrocity generations ago. So nothing should show, so no one would know when those who witnessed are gone. There are many stories about how Dyer Yassin came to be abandoned, why the people fled, Many Palestinians tell a story of mass killing, hence the massacre, and expulsion of their people by Jewish soldiers. The government of Israel denies a massacre and that soldiers fired in self-defense after attack and that they would not have needed to enter the city at all had Arab soldiers not blockaded and been starving the people in Jerusalem. However, not all Israelis believe the narrative of their government. So today's sermon is not going to ask you to discern the truth of what happened here. But what I want you to consider is just how it sits upon your heart. I also want you to have this history because as you hear it referenced in today's conflict, between Israel and Gaza, I want you to understand the root of the reference because it's really important. And I want to promise you I will not be describing any graphic descriptions um, of what happened there. For us to remember Diar Yassin properly, we need to understand its situation in the history of Israel and Palestine. In preparation for the sermon, I read materials from both Israeli and Palestinian perspectives, also from Christian authors, and for Israelis for, from Israelis for Peace, and the United Religious Institute, which is a peace advocacy group. I also, just for interest, I reviewed interviews of military personnel and civilians regarding a different village the massacre at Lida, another Palestinian town in Israel, so I could kind of understand Israeli 
operations in 1948 and Palestinian response and how the narratives are so different. So another piece of history in 1948, the United Nations resolved that Jerusalem would be an international city apart from the Arab and Jewish states, demarcated in the partition resolution, because that was supposed to happen in 1948, the partition of Israel and Palestinian land that would be roughly equal. There were over 150,000 Jewish inhabitants in Jerusalem, with 2,500 living in the old city. The United Nations, as I said, declared a two-state solution for the greater area, but Jerusalem would remain as a shared international city. In response to the United Nation and British plans, some Arabs and Palestinians blockaded 2,500 Jews living in the old city of Jerusalem. There were severe food shortages that followed shortly thereafter because nothing could get into the old city. The blockade eventually lasted for five months before Arabs were forced to surrender in May of 1948. So during the blockade, Jewish convoys attempted to bring food into the city by this road between Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Arab forces engaged in sporadic ambushes on the highway. Jewish leadership at the time reported that Deir Yassin, at the elevation of 2,600 feet, so up above looking down, was a potential target in an operation to open the road to Jerusalem. On April 6th, a Jewish operation was launched to open the road to Jerusalem. The village of Deir Yassin was included on the list of Palestinian villages to be occupied as part of, this of the operation. So Haganah commander David Shaltiel writes, and so he is really the head of the, he's the overarching umbrella of the Israeli military factions, which were Jewish at the time because Israel had not been established. He writes, I learn that you plan to attack, he's writing to other forces underneath him, but to the side. He said, I learned you plan to attack Diyar Yassin. I wish to point out that the capture of Diyar Yassin and its holding are one stage of our general plan. I have no objection to you carrying out the operation provided you are able to hold the village. Because if you're not able to do so, I warn you against blowing up the village, which will result in its inhabitants abandoning it, and its ruins and deserted houses will be occupied by foreign forces. Furthermore, if foreign forces took over, this would upset our general plan for establishing an airfield. So foreign forces refers primarily to fighters who came from Syria, Lebanon, Transjordan, and Iraq. The Jewish attack force, the Ergen, which again were part of this bigger umbrella, they decided to attack Deir Yassin on April 9th. And other forces, other Jewish forces were engaged in a different battle. The Ergen leader and later Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, describes the assault was carried out by 100 members of the Jewish fighting organization. He states there was a small open truck fitted with a loudspeaker that warned civilians to evacuate the area, and that some did. Other writers say this didn't happen with the truck and the loudspeaker because the truck rolled into a ditch before it started broadcasting any warnings. Another writer says the truck eventually got freed out of the ditch. And it did project a warning. But this writer says, I don't know if it could be heard. And I do know these appeals had no effect. So people stayed in their village. So you can start to feel the confusion going on. And you can start to hear the different stories and the different thinking about this village. And recall that while many Palestinians say the town was filled with peaceful residents, Jewish leadership, in hindsight, not at the time, states there were armed soldiers 
and there were defensive trenches built into the mountain. I looked at a photo of what was supposed to be defensive trenches, and I honestly couldn't see any difference from the trenches that are created from limestone cutting, which is what this town was famous for. So in the battle, there were four Jewish soldiers killed. One of them was killed by friendly fire. So we have three Jewish soldiers killed by Palestinians. Some reporting explains that the incredibly high Palestinian death toll was partly due to the method of storming civilian houses, which was simply to throw in a grenade. A representative of the Red Cross was escorted through Deir Yassin the following day. At the time, the number killed in this town was reported to the New York Times as 200, they called them Arabs, but they mean Palestinians, were killed, 40 captured, and 70 women and children released. They also reported that half, those, half of those who were killed were women, elderly, and children. That number was given to the New York Times by an Israeli source. Jews claimed that 250 people of their 400 village, so over half, they're saying, of the inhabitants were killed. At the time, Palestinian survivors of the town said, no, it was about 110. But then this number quickly grows to 250. And I want you to hold on to that as to why that number would get inflated. Families were later interviewed about the losses of their neighbors, their family, their friends. Some agreed to the uh, roughly about 107 civilians. The family members of some fighters were killed simply due to proximity. So regardless, we have an Israeli death toll of really three. I mean, it's four. It's four in the grieving of the families who lost people there but one killed by friendly fire. And the death toll of Palestinians was at least 107. Of these 107, 13 were called fighters because they had uh, rifles. Um, some of the, these rifles were 200 years old. So the Jewish agency, the bigger Jewish government, Upon learning about details of this attack, immediately expressed horror and disgust. There's a filmmaker, Nita Shoshani, who later, many decades later, interviewed many people. And she interviewed uh, people who were there at the time on each side. She also asked a Jewish intelligence officer who arrived the day after to, to say what he said to say what he saw, and he said, to me, it looked like a pogrom. When the, like when the Cossacks burst into Jewish neighborhoods, if it's a matter of killing innocent civilians, then it is a massacre. The Jewish, Jewish Youth Brigade, so this is how we sent our youth, the, <laughs> the Jewish Youth Brigade was sent to take care of the bodies, and I will not go into detail. Many of those who died were civilians, elderly, women, and they were not killed in postures of aggression. So this filmmaker, Anita Shoshani, sums up these interviews, and she says, she, well, she not only did interviews, she went and read documents, she asked the Israeli government to release things to her, and they would not. Um, there were actually court battles um, instigated by other agencies trying to get these um, documents to released, and they are still not released. But her conclusion is, she says, this was not a battle against fighters, but rather the sudden occupation of a village in confrontation with inhabitants who defended their homes by whatever meager means were available. There were also cases apparently isolated of executions after the fighting was over for the purpose of, defer of deterrence and creating fear. And can you hear, there's a tragedy under the tragedy for me. Families and neighbors are mourning one another. 
But there's also this war going on for propaganda of the deaths of their loved ones. Were there rebels living in this town or occupying this town or not? Remember the report from the Jewish commander, thinks not. He certainly doesn't mention them already being there. Instead, he says Arab fighters might move in if you can't control the village. Palestinians first report this smaller number of 110, and later they list 250. They also describe some horrific things that I will not pass on. And there are theories that they are inflating their numbers, and they're inflating what happened there to continue to have Arab countries stay involved with their battle. Israelis also inflated these numbers. And was that so that they could scare other Palestinians, so they could terrorize them into abandoning their villages with lesser or no resistance? There's also a lot of discrepancy as to whether the intent at any point in planning the attack really was to kill so many inhabitants. There was an escape corridor for the village, and more than 200 residents left through the escape corridor. Israeli accounts proudly say they left unharmed, which I really doubt, since they would have been completely emotionally traumatized. They leave, left their food. They were leaving with very little food, little water, and only possessions they could carry. They were not unharmed. There's agreement on both sides. Israel and Palestine to one fact, that we have an incredibly lopsided death toll. So tragedy upon tragedy unfolds after Diyar Yassin and word spread like wildfire. Within four days after the reports of Diyar Yassin, Arab forces ambushed a Jewish convoy on the way to a hospital. They killed 77 Jews, including doctors, nurses, and patients. And here we are today with the Hamas killing and the kidnapping of Jews, Israel bombing Gaza until there will be no buildings left and the population being plagued with starvation. We are still here today. And you will hear in the present conflict a reference again and again to Diyar Yassin. So these stories of the mass killing it triggered a mass flight of Palestinians from their homes and the land around, from Jerusalem and beyond, from land that was not drawn to be the Jewish state by the United Nations. 600 Palestinian villages emptied, and many of them just leveled to the ground. So in the end, three quarters of the Palestinian population fled or were expelled from their homeland, and Israel held 78% of what used to be Palestine. This is what you hear referenced in current, event, in current days as the Nakba, the catastrophe, and now you've been there, so you know what it means. Leadership in Israel continue to refuse to release photographs of what happened there after the shooting and after the grenades. So I don't think we can really determine the nitty gritty facts of what happened there but I don't think we have to to understand the tragedy and why there should be a Remembrance Day like there was this past week and why I'm preaching about it this morning. I know this was gonna be hard for all of you to hear. What I hope you glean is empathy, compassion, and the ability to think about why things might get manipulated one way or the other. So no matter the numbers, it was a terrible tragedy that lives on today. What Palestinians have asked for across the decades is to build a memorial at Diyar Yassin, the site of, in the site of the old city. It's five kilometers outside of Jerusalem. It is also next to the Jewish Holocaust Memorial Yad Vashem, they look across at one another, the ruins and, and Yad Vashem. And Yad Vashem is famous throughout the world and brings many, many visitors each year. 
So if the Palestinians were allowed to establish this memorial, the two memorial sites would just look at one another. And what would it mean to reckon with both sides of that suffering at the same time? There's an organization of Jewish and Palestinian members trying to establish a memorial, and I'm gonna close with their words. I'm also gonna close by saying, I normally preach a much happier sermon than this for our visitors. <laughs> But it is Arab American Heritage Month, and it is the week of the remembrance. And it does speak directly to our current events. So these are the words from the organization trying to establish the memorial. They say, Diyar Yassin is the most pivotal and symbolic event of the 1948 war. It is remembered annually with commemorations throughout the world. Our long-term goal is to build a fitting memorial at Deir Yassin, where today there is not even a sign. We have heard calls for revolutionary forgiveness, forgiveness with truth and justice, forgiveness to take place in the broken middle of Jerusalem. Those of us committed to the memory and to the meaning of Deir Yassin believe that such a reconciliation should take place right at the site of Deir Yassin and Yad Vashem. A truthful and visible memorial, clearly viewed from the Holocaust Museum. May this not only be a symbol of the way out, but our first way out. Only through truthful recognition of past events can healing in the present begin. May it be so.